I want to begin and just open up with the book, A Story of Job. And Job chapter 1, starting in verse 13. You know the kind of scene that's going on here, if you've read the story of Job, the interaction that's happening with God and Satan, and, and there's a whole theology to talk about there. I don't want to get into all that. I just want to focus on what happens to Job and how Job responds. It says that one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servant to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, while, while this message was still on his lips, while he was still getting it out, it says that another messenger came in and said, the fire of God fell from the sky and it burned up the sheep and the servants and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and they swept down on your camels and they carried them off. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, yet another messenger, this is the fourth one now, came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at their oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and it struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are all dead. I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Now at this point, most of us, myself included, would be so upset and so frustrated that we would turn our faces to God and maybe even make a fist and say, God, why have you done this? What is your plan? What is going on? I have been a servant for you and this is how you treat me. We got to have a talk. But that's not what Job does. In verse 20, it says that Job got up and he tore his robes and shaved his head, which was a sign of mourning. And then he fell to the ground in, and what does it say, folks? In worship. In what? Worship. In what? Worship. worship. I know, it's like throwing raw meat to a dog here this morning, you know. But he, he fell down in worship. He didn't stand with his fist clenched to God and say, God, why have you done this? But he fell down and he worshiped. And then he said this. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Having such a terrible news, one after another, after another, after another, how could Job respond and worship to God? How did he keep from going into that dark hole, separating himself from the world, pushing everybody out, and just staying to himself? I think it was because because he understood that his earthly frailty and his earthly weakness was made strong in the power and the strength of an almighty God. I think that he had an understanding of knowing who God was and who he was. And though God may give to him and God may take away, he is still almighty God and he's worthy of praise. And that's exactly what Job did. Now, how do we do that today? Because all of us go through these trying times, these hard moments in life. We all have times of great stress, great pressure, personal attacks. We all have times where we feel like I can't take any more bad news. If I get one more phone call, one more news report, one more knock on the door of something bad happening, I'm just going to freak out. We all have those moments. When we feel like we're in such a way, we need then more than ever to turn to the word of God for encouragement. We need to be reminded that our strength is not by the arm of flesh, but it is by the arm of faith. When I think of the Apostle Paul, I am reminded that he was no stranger to the pressures of life. Paul suffered many hardships for the sake of the gospel. You know that he talks about them, how he was beaten because he preached the word of God, how he was shipwrecked as he was being taken to be tried for the word of God. He was stoned after having a gospel revival in Iconium and he got back up, he went back in the city and he finished his third point. He kept on preaching. He talks about how he was naked and hungry and thirsty and bruised and flogged and jailed all for the cause of Christ. And he used those experiences to write a letter to a struggling church in Corinth. You remember the first first letter he wrote was a corrective letter about problems that were going on in the church and he told them how to deal with those things and he kind of ends at the end with 15 and 16 they were talking about the resurrection and the power that we have in Christ Jesus and he has to write a second letter to the church there some follow-up things but in that second letter Paul writes down his experience that he has suffered for the cause of Christ and that became a great encouragement to that church and I want to read it today because I think it's a great encouragement to us this is where our sermon's going to come from okay it's 2 Corinthians in chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Paul writes these words. 
But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. I want to tell you that if you're here today and you're just about ready to be swallowed up by the waves of life, that you're in the right place. If you're here today and you're just about ready to go under, to give in, to give up, let me encourage you that you're with good company and there's no reason to fear because God is on your side. There is strength to carry on. There is hope in Christ. And no matter what your circumstances, circumstances is and what you're facing God can and will overcome amen Amen. I feel like preaching (laughs) let's look at Paul saying here and break this down he says but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us I want you to write this down and get this in your heart that we are fragile but we are made strong in Christ Yes, we are fragile in this world. Our body is weak and it's going to fall apart, but we are made strong in Christ. Paul uses this illustration about jars of clay. These were these massive jars formed out of clay, baked in the sun. They were used for keeping oil or water or wine in there. And they were very, very useful, but they were very, very fragile. You bounce them against one another and they would shatter. Like fine china, we set out, it has a purpose, it has a use, but we're real cautious about it, right? Don't bang the plates, you know. It's not Corel where we don't beat this stuff up because it will shatter. And he talks about that that is what our bodies are like. That we have this wonderful treasure that the treasure is the gospel message of Jesus Christ, but it is put in something fragile. That thing fragile is our bodies. Our bodies are going to be broken and they're going to wear out. They are not durable. They are not meant to last forever. Can I get a witness? You know, yeah, some of you are like, hey, I took 14 to leave just to get to church today. Our bodies are going to wear out from the moment that we are born to the, t- we slowly make a trek right back to the grave. No matter how much exercise we get, we cannot reverse the effect of time and stress on our bodies. Eventually, as the psalmist says, that we will lie silent in the grave. And Paul says that God uses our fragileness, our frailty to show off his power. We are made strong not by what we do. We are made strong by what he has already done. Amen. Amen. Paul had an affliction, right? But Paul said, as he was talking, Jesus speaking to him, my grace is sufficient for you, Jesus said to Paul, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Then Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest in me. Paul had an affliction. We don't know what it was. The scripture never shares with us. It's probably a good thing because if we saw that, we go, well, he doesn't know about this problem. But Paul had a problem and it reminded him every day of his weakness, but he was made strong in Christ. Gideon was a weak man and he didn't see himself as a warrior. He was scared, but in the eyes of God, God saw a great and mighty warrior and used him to achieve victory for the people of Israel. David was a small shepherd boy, the youngest of his brothers. His father wouldn't even bring him before Samuel and say this might be the potential king because he was a peewee pipsqueak. But he was the one that God saw who would be a giant slayer who became the king of Israel and was a man after God's own heart. Moses was weak and poor in his ability to speak and he stuttered and he said, God, don't send me to Pharaoh. I can't can't, can't talk to Pharaoh. And yet God sent him there because God saw a great leader in him and he demanded to Pharaoh let my people go and he led them out into the wilderness and he led them out into freedom. Abraham was an old man and yet he well past childbearing childbearing age and yet God saw in him a father of many nations through the promised son, promised son of Isaac Hezekiah was given a death sentence but God spared his life and gave him 15 more years to rule over the people of Israel. Peter felt like a failure after having denied Christ but he was restored and became the first gospel preacher on the day of Pentecost of which we are beneficiaries of. Amen? Know this, that though you are frail in your mind, you are not frail in God's mind. He sees you as a strong and mighty warrior. Why? Because he sees in you his son. He doesn't see you how you see you. Paul goes on to say that we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Number two, I want you to get this down. That we are being squeezed, but we have not collapsed. 
We are being squeezed, but we have not collapsed. Pressure is an amazing and powerful thing. Many of us have seen the Science Channel, and we can see how a hollow can can simply be crushed, implode under the extreme pressures of the ocean depth. I remember when I was a boy, and they had discovered the Titanic on the ocean floor, and all those pictures came out. Amazing pictures. All of a sudden, you're coming out of the darkness, and there's the bow of the ship, and there was the deck, and there were where the lifeboats were, and all that different stuff. But the thing that amazed me the most was the stuff that they found on the ground on the sea floor there. It was a bottle of wine and the cork was still in it and wine was still in that bottle and that bottle had not crushed under the pressure being two miles under the surface of the ocean. You know why? Because the pressure inside the bottle was equal to the pressure outside of the bottle and that got my mind thinking in a spiritual way that our lives are very much like that. That we only are crushed when we are hollow on the inside but when we have the Spirit of God inside of us then the pressure inside of us is equal to the pressure outside of us and we can withstand the pressure that comes against us. Amen? Amen. If you are being crushed, it's because the pressure inside of you is leaking out. It is empty and you need to pour the Spirit of God into you. Get into His Word. Meditate on His Word. Pray to the Father and ask the Spirit of God to empower you. He will. You need that pressure on a daily basis on the inside. You know why? Because we all leak. We need to constantly be filled up with the pressure of God. And when the Holy Spirit is in us, we can stand up under the pressure that is around us. And it is around us. And so though it may be squeezing us, we have not collapsed because God is inside of us. Paul goes on to say, perplexed, but not in despair. Perplexed, but not in despair. I like to think about it like this, that we have questions, but we are still trusting in God. We have questions, but we are still trusting in God. All of us ask God the question, why? Why, God? Why me? Why now? Why in this way? Why in this manner? Why to my family? Why, God? I need to understand why. And the thing is that the answers will never come to satisfy those questions. And that's why I come back to the scriptures and I read Isaiah 55, 8 that says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. When we ask why, God says, you shouldn't ask why. You don't understand what I'm thinking. You can't understand what I'm doing. You can't conceive of the master plan that I see from my vantage point of heaven. That's why Job 37, 5 says that God's voice thunders in a marvelous way. He does great things beyond our understanding. God moves in a way we do not understand. And when we ask God, even if he told us the answer, our minds could not contain it. So we need to simply trust in him. Even though we have questions, we say, God, I don't understand this, but you are the sovereign Lord. I am a servant of the sovereign Lord, and I will trust in you. Though I don't understand, and it doesn't make sense. It made no sense for Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, the promised child. And yet God says, go and make him a burnt offering. That meant slitting his throat and burning him on the altar. Abraham knew exactly what that meant. And he got to the altar there. It says he bound the boy. He put him on the altar. And I'm sure Isaac was saying, hold on dad, let's talk about this for a minute. But he got that knife up there and he got ready to plunge it into his son. And at that moment, the voice from heaven spoke and God said, now that I see you have not been willing to withhold your son, your one and only son. And he provided a ram in the thicket. And he taught us a lesson that we didn't understand then, but we understand now on this side of the cross that God was willing to go all the way, that he would send his son, Jesus Christ, his one and only son, to die, to pay for the sins of the world. It made no sense for Elijah to drench the sacrifice on Mount Carmel with jars and jars and jars of water and then pray to God to light the sacrifice. But that is exactly what he did. And after it was completely soaked and water was sitting in the trenches, he prayed to God and God poured out fire and it consumed consumed the sacrifice. It consumed the altar and it licked up the water in the trays there. And then he went and he put the prophets of Baal to death. And there was a great victory for God in that moment. It made no sense for Joshua to take the nation of Israel and walk around the walls of Jericho for seven days. But that's what the Israelites did. They followed in the footsteps of Joshua who followed the leadership of God. And when they blew the trumpets on that seventh day, these mighty massive walls of Jericho came tumbling down and they walked right in and they took the city. Doesn't make any sense to us, but it made perfect sense to someone trusting in God. To our human intellect, it makes no sense for a holy God to leave the glories of heaven, to come and to rescue sinful man, but that is 
is exactly what God did. Paul wrote about it in Philippians. That Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to. But entered, uh, emptied himself, came to earth in the form of a man, taking the position of a servant, died at the hands of his creation that didn't even care about him. Because he loved them. Doesn't make sense to us, but it makes sense to a mighty God who says this is the only way that we can restore the balance of a relationship back with God. Understand this, that you might have questions, and I get it, I have them too, but still trust in God. He loves you, and he is in control. He says in verse 9, persecuted, but not abandoned. That means that we suffer, but we are not alone. We suffer, but we are not alone. Remember what Jesus said. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The world is the enemy of God. And being a follower of Christ means that we will experience hardship, persecution, and suffering. Jesus reminded his disciples that if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. A cross was an instrument of death. And the disciples understood that. When Jesus said, take up your cross, he said, be willing to embrace your death. He doesn't say, hey, take up your lazy boy and it's all going to be fine. He says, take up your cross, be ready to die for me. I heard a preacher say once, the thing about a cross is that you only face in one direction. When you're put on a cross, you can't see behind you. You are facing forward. And then when you come to Christ, that's the way it is. And what you're facing is eternity. You would die your life to Jesus Christ. And the world is wanting to harm us. And we shouldn't think it strange when that happens. Following Jesus means that we will suffer. And people are suffering right now, this very hour, around the world. We hear it every day about Christians who are losing their lives because they, they claim Christ and their heads are being cut off. And they stand up and say, yes, I'm a believer. And someone shoots them. And we worry about that. What a better way to go than to standing for your faith for Jesus Christ. These are people who have made the test. They have stood the test. They have passed the test. They've gone on to a better place. They have done what we only hope we would do if faced with that situation. And it is coming, folks. It is coming. It's already crossed the seas. We see it in our own country, and it's only going to get worse. Have you ever read the book of Revelation? It don't, things don't get better and better and better. They get worse. But we need to stand our ground because when we suffer, we do not suffer alone. We suffer with other Christians, and we suffer with Jesus himself. When the three Hebrew children were taken into Babylonian captivity and they were told to bow down to the golden idol, they would not. They were faced with their own death if they didn't bow down. And you know what they said? That's what they said. We're not going to bow down. And so they took them to the fiery furnace and they heated it seven times hotter than what it was. In fact, it said the soldiers were even consumed by the flames because they got so close. They were thrown into the fiery furnace. And you know what happened? They started walking around in that fiery furnace there. And when the king peered in to see, he didn't see one, two, three, but he saw four. And he said that fourth man looked like a son of the God. Now, I don't know who he was, but I happen to think it was Jesus who showed up. We call that in our world a theophany, where he came in the form of a man so people could see. I think that those guys needed a God who would show up, and they did show up. And when the king called them out, there was no burn on them. There was not even the smell of smoke on them. Why? Because God... God showed up in the midst of their fire. When Daniel would not stop his prayer routine, uh, he was thrown into the lion's den, right? And I'm sure he was terrified as those lions were around there, ferocious, ready to tear him up. But what did he do? He got down on his knees and he prayed to God and the angel of the Lord locked the lion's jaw. And the next day when the king came, there was Daniel petting them little kitty cats saying, hey, why don't you come on down in here? Because my God is a great God and he is still with me today. When Paul was in prison in Acts 23 because the Sanhedrin was about ready to tear him apart. They put him in prison for his own safety. And there he's thinking, what's going to happen next? But it says these wonderful, powerful words. He says that the following night, the Lord came and stood near Paul. That means he showed up. And he showed up in such a way that Paul heard him talk to him. He said, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. I want to tell you, folks, when you're going through the fire, when you're in that lion's den, when you're in prison, when you're all by yourself, God will show up. Amen. If you're suffering for the cause of Christ today, do not think it's strange. 
Realize that everyone who claims Jesus as Lord will suffer at some point for their faith. But take heart in knowing that Jesus is right there next to you. He is nearby. He will walk through that valley with you. He will even carry you when you can't carry yourself. Paul says that we are struck down but not destroyed. Struck down but not destroyed. I like to think about it like this. That we might be on the ropes but we are still serving God. We might be on the ropes we might be trying to just, just hold in there and lay in there, but we are still serving God. Sometimes life can take the wind out of your sails. I had two older brothers. I know what it's like being punched in the gut and lose your wind. You're just like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And you just think, oh, I need another breath of air. And that happens to us in our lives. In our spiritual lives, we get a gut punch and it takes the wind right out of our sails. We're given a diagnosis of cancer and our heart sinks. We lose our job and we worry about the coming bills that are going to mount. We're rejected by a boyfriend or a girlfriend and we think we're always going to be alone all the rest of our lives. And life can throw us down to the mat. In fact, the Greek word here talking about this is to be knocked down or thrown down as in a boxing match or in a wrestling match. I know what it was like. I wrestled when I was in eighth grade. I had a great view of the ceiling and all the lights many times on my mats there. If you know about anything about wrestling, laying on your back is not where you're supposed to be. But I had a wonderful time. I used my weight to help me out on the county, the, the final championship on the county match. I shared this with you before, right? There was one guy in my class, there's six schools, and we were wrestling, and he was beating me by points. About 30 seconds, the match is almost over. He's going to win. He made, a, he made a wrong move. I fell on top of him. I was so heavy, he couldn't get up. I pinned him, and I won the championship. <laughs> Don't tell me there's not a God. There is a God. <laughs> He looks down even on the dumbest of us, right? He loves us all. He loves us all. When we are thrown down to the mat and we have something that takes it, just understand that we are still serving God. When we're on the ropes, we are not out of the fight. The Hebrew writer says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. That means if life is still in you, your lungs are breathing, your heart's pumping, you have a call of God in your life. You know, my brother, he owns a martial arts academy and he does Brazilian jiu-jitsu and he's all high-speed, low-drag kind of stuff, real good with all of that. But the thing I find interesting when I've watched him on his things is he is almost more effective when he is on the mat than when he's standing up. When I would think that he's down, he gets down there and he puts someone in a chokehold, he puts them to sleep, man. It's really kind of cool to watch your brother put some people to sleep, you know what I'm saying? And then you want to give him a list of some people you'd like to have put to sleep. But anyway, the whole nother sermon. But when he's down on the mat there I just watch him you think you know you think he's going to be out you think that you know this is bad for him. someone like me is going to fall on him and pin him but that's not what happens he just goes to work and he wins and I want to tell you you might be thrown down to the mat but you can still bite I don't know if it's legal but pull out the claws do something and in a spiritual world when you're thrown down to the mat you still keep fighting. You, if you haven't given up your life, then you need to use your life for the call of God. As long as you're still breathing, you're still fighting. Joseph was sold into slavery, and yet he honored God. And because he honored God, he was elevated to second in the house of Potiphar. And though that position led him to be falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and he was thrown in prison, he honored God, and in prison he began to run the prison cell. And though he was forgotten about for many years in the prison cell, finally God remembered and he was brought up and elevated to second in charge of Egypt by interpreting the dream of Pharaoh. And because of that, he saved that whole region of the world, bringing his family down from the famine. Know this, it might look bad at the beginning, but God can still use you. Paul and Silas were beaten. They were thrown in prison, put in the inner space. Uh, part of the prison fastened in, their sto in the stocks, hands and legs there. Miserable, miserable time. But in the midnight hour, the Bible says that they were singing praises unto God. And the people in that prison heard the gospel message preached and praises to God and prayers being given unto God. And why did he allow them to be in the prison? I think because he might not ever have gotten the message to those people if he hadn't allowed them to go to prison. God might be letting you go through some hard time. He might be letting you go through some suffering. He might be letting you be thrown down to the mat. Why? Because he wants to soften your heart so that you can, can, can be compassionate to other people who are going through that same suffering. You might never talk to someone about the, about the issue you're going through until you start to go through. You might never visit someone or go share with them the gospel message until the wind was taken out of your sails and you were humbled to their position and then you became brothers of common suffering. 
Peter denied Jesus as friend, his master, and his Lord three times. He stood around that burn barrel and they said, hey, hey, you're the guy that was with this man over here. They're getting ready to crucify him. Oh, that wasn't me. And even that little, that little servant girl came there. And the little servant girl scared him off, right? And he called down curses on himself and on God, trying to show that he wasn't with them. And then the rooster crowed. And he remembered what Jesus had said. And his heart sank and he went out and it says he wept bitterly. You know what Peter did? He went back to his fishing. He figured, I'm a lost cause. Every, I might as well give up. I've abandoned my Lord. I've got no integrity. I've got no honesty. And I'm just, I'm just going to go back to fishing. And Jesus came and he met him on the Sea of Galilee. He met him where Peter was. And you know the story, he asked him, he said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you, then feed my sheep. He asked him again, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you, take care of my lambs. He asked him a third time, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know all things, you know I love you. He said, care for my lambs. And Peter was restored back to fellowship with Jesus Christ. And Peter never once looked back after that moment there. He moved forward knowing that he had been restored because he was down. He was put down to the mat. He was on the ropes. He was being beat up, but he was still serving God. And God ignited that spark within him and said, get back out there. You might be being beat up by the world. And that spark is in there and you think it's about ready to go out. Don't blow it out. Fan that spark into flame because God is with you. You're not out of the fight. Amen. You've got to get back into it. Don't quit. Don't stop fighting. Don't give up. I love that little, that little picture that's drawn. It's like, um, I don't know what it is, a fly, a bug or something. And it's swallowed like uh, the frog has swallowed it. And you can see him, though his head's inside the frog's mouth, he's choking the frog. It's like, I ain't going down without taking you with me, brother. <laughs> if the world is pushing in on you, fight back. Take a few of them with you is what I say. Take them to see Jesus. You're not out of the fight yet. Don't go too far with that. <laughs> I have a bunch of Christians out there pommeling people, you know. Paul says a few more things here about personal suffering. And then he concludes with these final words. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that will outweigh them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is temporary, for, for what, is, what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Let me just unpack this a little bit. Paul says that we, we don't lose heart. Why? Because he just talked about all these things here. Being squeezed, being pressured in, thrown down the mat. But we haven't collapsed. We haven't given in. And since we haven't collapsed and we haven't given in, we're not going to lose heart. Church, don't lose heart. We are on the winning side. I have to be reminded, no matter how bad everything gets out there, that I am on the winning team. It's already won. So, so act victorious. Don't act like, like droopy, like, oh, he's no good. I'm not going to win. I mean, you are already a winner in Christ Jesus. So don't lose heart. And though outwardly we're wasting away, yes, this body ain't as good as it used to be 20 years ago. I know it's, things are wearing out. I've got to take more leave than necessary. I get all that. But what I am being renewed is, is my spirit inside. That's why we say young at heart because it really doesn't sound good when you go old in body. You know, that don't sound good. So we say young at heart. That our heart and our passion and our soul is still alive and is being renewed day by day. This body is going to waste away. These eyes will grow dim. These ears are already starting to go deaf. I certainly don't speak very well, but God is still renewing my soul. For our light and momentary troubles, he says. I mean, don't you just want to say, Paul, are you serious? Our light and momentary troubles. But Paul sees things from God's perspective a little bit here. And he says, those things that you have, these little things over here, when weighed over against on the scale of God and the blessings that he has for us, boom, boom, throw them suckers off the scale. But we go, oh, these light and momentary troubles are so heavy. And the blessings of God, oh, they're so far away. And we can't understand them. And I'll never get through, woe is me, woe, woe. Uh, God, Paul says, these are light momentary things. When you think about what God God has for you, this does not matter. And even if you lose your life, what do you gain? A life eternal with Christ Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, come. That's what John said. Because he was ready for it. And we need to fix our eyes, <coughs> not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Stop looking at the stuff that is around you and seeing the problems. 
see the unseen glory yet to be revealed. When I was learning to, to, to do marksmanship in the Marine Corps, I remember very specifically what they would say. They would talk about if you're going to be a good marksman, you have to look at the front sight post. Do not look at your target. That's what everyone thinks. Hey, look at your target. If you look at your target, your front sight post might be way over here because you're looking way down there and you will miss it. But if you look at the front sight post, get it very clear, centered in the rear aperture, you will always hit the target when you place it on that blurry target way down there. You'll hit it again and again and again and again. Folks, we are looking at the world around us and we are not focusing on the front sight post, which is the lens of Jesus Christ. When we look at our world through Jesus and we focus on him, it doesn't matter what we put him on, what problem we put him on, we hit that problem. We hit it right in the bullseye every single time. Stop looking on the, at the things that are around us, but think about the things that are unseen. Look through the lens of Jesus Christ because he says this, what is seen is temporary. Your house is going to be eaten by termites. We live in Florida. They're all around us. <laughs> Some of you need a new house. I know what you're saying. It's temporary. You, you, the cars you drive are going to rust out. The things you buy are going to be outdated. You buy a phone today, tomorrow it's outdated, right? You know, you buy a computer today, the moment you bought it, it's already outdated. You know, everything, it's all, this is all temporary. But what we, need to, what we cannot see is eternal. We cannot possibly understand and fathom that, but God says it's real. So stop looking at the stuff that is around here and start looking up at the things that matter. Let me wrap things up as Mark comes and our team comes to lead us. Paul reminds us to take perspective of the situation. To not focus on our earthly troubles that we can see, but to focus on the spiritual blessings still yet to be revealed on that great day. For what God has made for us in heaven far outweighs the troubles and the pains of this life. And so we do not lose heart. And I just want to say it again. I would just keep shouting it. Do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. Your heart is all you have. That's why we say put your whole heart into the fight. Give your whole heart to this situation. You've given your heart to Jesus and to his call for your life and to his church. So don't lose heart. He didn't lose heart for you. Don't lose heart for him. Press on. Why? Because he loves you. He cares for you. You are his child. You are a, a prince and princess unto the king of all the universe. And so, yes, we say we are hard pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, wondering, but we are not in despair. Persecuted, yes, but we have not been abandoned. Struck down, laying on the mat, yes, but we are not destroyed. We are not out of the fight. And as Paul says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us more than conquerors. That means we are victorious and then beyond. So church, don't give in. Don't give up. Stick it out. God loves you. He's in charge. He's in control. He knows your life. He knows who you are. And He will carry you through. Let's pray.